Hey, good afternoon to you. Mark Sadoth, Hurricane Track here, Wednesday now, the 4th of September, 2024. I am very glad you tuned in to today's video because we're going to take a look at something very important. Why is it so quiet? What has happened? What has gone wrong with these seasonal forecasts from all of the reputable agencies? And wait till I show you this one graphic about how many entities so far have gotten it wrong. And I say so far because, look, let's be honest. We do not know what the future holds. We don't, even with the most reliable computer models. And you know what's funny about that? The proof is in the pudding. We don't really know the future. We thought we knew several months ago that on September 4th, we would probably have a whole bunch of hurricanes dotting the map here. Well, that's a satellite picture, but you get the point. And we were wrong. So to say, well, the rest of the season is going to end up just like this, we don't know. We honestly don't know. But let's take a look at why it is so quiet and uh, dig into it a little bit deeper, maybe even a lot deeper. All right, again, important update. Thanks for watching. Let's get started. First of all, hey, way back in the beginning of my career, just a year after graduating college, 28 years ago, I graduated 29 years ago, 1995, Tomorrow's the 28th anniversary of Hurricane Fran, the first eye of a hurricane that I was in, to my knowledge. I don't think any other ones when I was a little kid made it over me with the eye. Uh, but definitely Fran, way back on September 5th, 1996, that anniversary coming up tomorrow. A lot of us remember that very well here in southeast North Carolina, up through the Triangle area, Raleigh, and so forth. Oh yeah, that was a big one. Anyway, so... A huge difference between 28 years ago and now. You know, you look at these areas and say, hey, there's uh, three yellow X's out there. Uh-oh. But all of these are low probability areas for development. They all stay yellow throughout the next seven days. That's very unusual to see on September 4th, that is for sure. So what is the deal? Well, one thing that we can see immediately is the lack of deep convection, thunderstorms, Anywhere across the tropical Atlantic down here, there's just not much. A little bit of thunderstorm activity here, a little bit more there, some over here, and some in the Gulf of Mexico. Nothing is concentrating. Everything is spread out like cotton candy being pulled apart, or taffy, or whatever the candy sugar confection is of your choice. That's kind of interesting, a little low-pressure area northwest of Bermuda. Watch this get its act together, separate from that front and become a named storm at some point. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, it could happen. You never know. So this is the current situation. Now let's start digging into what on earth has gone wrong with all of these forecasts. And I'm going to begin this part with a very important post here from Matt down at Wink TV and uh, the chief meteorologist down there. Friendly reminder, Matt says, that Colorado State University and NOAA weren't the only ones going hyperactive for 2024 hurricane season. Look at all these companies and universities, whether they're independent or whatever, that also did the forecasting as well. The overall preliminary average was 23 named storms. The highest was from the University of Pennsylvania, 33 named storms, and I agree with that. Yikes, we all said that when uh, Dr. Michael Mann issued that. And the lowest was Gary Lezak, whoever that is. Uh, I don't know who that is. I honestly don't. I'm not mocking it. I don't know who that is. Uh, and I haven't taken the time to look it up because I've never heard that name before that I'm aware of. So whatever. But look at this ni nice little infographic. This is off of the hurricane, the seasonalhurricanepredictions.org website. So yeah, there's a lot of different entities here. NOAA, Colorado State. Something called 268 Weather, Weather Works, Weather Tiger, TSR. They've been around a while. Um, I don't know who Schlotthauer is. Again, not a dig. I just don't know who that is. You got AccuWeather. That's a name we know. And then goes on on down the list. The UK Met Office. I mean, come on. That's the UK Met. The Brits do a pretty good job forecasting. And they were calling for a very, very busy season. You got the Weather Bell folks in here led by, I'm assuming... Joe Bastardi, who back in December was jumping out in front saying, oh, we're going to have a season to remember, something like that. And then I think in March literally said, 
I believe it was in the post, hurricane season from hell. I'm just quoting what the man said. So it is not one individual person, you know, putting this out and trying to scare people and fear monger or whatever. Maybe hurricane season from hell is not the best headline. That's my opinion. We certainly have never said anything like that. But merely saying and publishing information uh, that a hyperactive hurricane season is likely, I don't really understand why that is fear-mongering. Now, that is a whole other thing for psychologists and behavioral scientists to deal with. It, it's whatever. That boggles my mind. Um, because you don't have the same thing when you deal with, like, sports. You know, when people are predicting that some team is going to blow another team out. They don't get all upset with that prediction and say, well, you're just fear-mongering. I don't know, maybe it's because hurricanes certainly are much more <laughs> fearful, I get it, than, than football, for uh, as an example here. But these are the agencies. These are the people, all right? And so everybody was out on that limb together. And nature has <laughs> sawed a good part of that limb off. But not the whole limb, and certainly not the trunk of the tree. Good metaphor there. I have to write that one down. That's an original. That's a freebie. But seriously, these are these are the uh, the folks that were seeing the signs that uh, were wrong. They led us the wrong direction. What were some of those signs? I'll just remind you. The biggest, most obvious, and this is just so vastly important. No El Nino. We have, and this is today's date, September. Well, it's yesterday. It's always a day behind. So the La Nina was going to be developing, and it's well on its way now, followed by a record warm Atlantic, which we know, facts, if we look at the past, what has given us our busiest hurricane seasons? When we have a record warm Atlantic, mainly the deep tropics, and the absence of El Nino, that is the two most important things, generally speaking, our two most obvious large puzzle pieces. But there are other puzzle pieces as well, obviously. Because if it was just as simple as this, we would already be up to our 15th name storm and well on our way to all of these high-end predictions. But it's not just these two puzzle pieces, clearly. And it's not like we just figured that out this year. There is definitely more to it than what we see here. But these are the two biggest parts. If you have an El Nino and a coolish Atlantic, the El Nino typically overrides the Atlantic. You get a lot of shear, a lot of dry air, and other factors, and you don't get many hurricanes. Last year was really interesting because we did have the raging El Nino out here. This was all well above normal, and the Atlantic was well above normal, so they counteracted each other, and we ended up, and this is hard to believe, just a year ago, or at least once we finished it up, we had 20 named storms last year with a strong El Nino. What? That is amazing. It really is. Yet, last year's season, especially if you look at Colorado State, just singling them out, did a very good job saying, we think that could happen. That the Atlantic being so anomalously warm as it was last year could lead to a very active season, and that is indeed what we had. But the perception was, because we only, air quotes there, had a Dahlia hitting the United States in a major way, uh, most people think of last year as being, well, that wasn't very busy. We almost used up the list. We missed it by one. That's incredible. So, of course, when we get to a season like this, and you remove the El Nino, but you keep the very warm Atlantic overall, you would have to think logically, oh, we're going to have an incredible hurricane season in front of us. And, you know, if there's some fear-mongering, maybe that's what it needs to take to, fo to motivate people. I don't like that word, though, fear and scary. Hey, look, you just have to be motivated to do something. And we talk about that a lot. Being prepared and whatever means that works for you and your family. So let's take a look. This is Dr. Klotzbach, the lead author now, uh, taking over several years ago from uh, the late, uh, great, legendary Dr. William Gray. And he put out an extensive, very, very thorough uh, explanation as to what is going on. And it is right here. And we're going to spend the next several minutes going through this. I'm not going to read it word by word, but I will read this first paragraph word by word because this is very important. And I want to preface this by saying, how extraordinary is it? I mean, it 
if you know Dr. Klotzbach and how academia works is not extraordinary, but in the world of science being so distrusted as of late, really the last decade or so, it is wonderful to see accountability. And hey, let's update, let's see what's going on, analyzing things in real time. Back to sports analogies, again, they work so well because most of us can relate. It is just like an award-winning coach who should be doing really well and they're not in a particular game and halfway through the game or a third of the way through the game or whatever it is, sometimes two-thirds of the way through the game, <clears throat> the uh, Patriots versus the Falcons in 2017 Super Bowl, they made adjustments and the Patriots came back and they beat the Falcons who were up 28-3, to right? Coaches make changes based on what they see is not going right. So obviously Dr. Klotzbach can't change the atmosphere, contrary to what some people think on the internet. Uh, he is at least saying, hey, I see it too. Let's, get, let's, let's deep dive into what's going on out there. So huge round of applause. That's great. Accountability. It is important in the science, and especially when things go wrong. Because when things go right, if this forecast had been spot on, would we all be like, ah, whatever, they were spot on, doggone it? No, it'd be like celebrated. Well, they got it, yet it would mean that probably a lot of people would be suffering right now. So we could all agree we could do without the hurricanes. They're interesting to track, but anyway, let's get on with it. Sorry, I'm going to get off on a tangent, and I'm going to make this thing an hour long. So the discussion. 2024 Atlantic hurricane season got off to an extremely fast start with Hurricane Barrel becoming the earliest Category 5 hurricane in the Atlantic on record. Uh, hurricanes Debbie and Ernesto followed in early and mid-August, respectively, leading to a well-above-average season through the middle part of August. Read that again, folks. We had everything right on the money all the way up to the middle part of August. And then, bam, this brick wall. And Phil says it much more succinctly. However... He doesn't say, bam, a brick wall. He says, however, since Ernesto dissipated on the 20th of August, the Atlantic has had no name storm activity. As we near the climatological peak of hurricane season, we discussed the 2024 season in detail, including several possible reasons for the recent dearth, lack of, <laughs> for those of you, what's a dearth in Atlantic hurricane activity? These reasons include northward, shift, uh, northward shifted monsoon trough resulting in an easterly in African easterly waves emerging too far north of latitude. Extremely warm upper level temperatures resulting in stabilization of the uh, atmosphere. Too much easterly shear in the eastern Atlantic and more recently, unfavorable subseasonal variability associated with the Madden Julian oscillation. So let me just make this real easy because that's a lot of science in there, a lot of big words. The monsoon trough and the associated African easterly jet typically is your hurricane factory. You get the tropical waves that come out all the way from the Ethiopian highlands sometimes, and these seedlings come out, and normally they come out at a certain latitude. And when they do that, with a very warm Atlantic and all these other things that are in place, you get a very, very busy hurricane season. This year, we can see that the intertropical convergent zone, well, not so much that, it's more the monsoon trough, and the African easterly jet, and basically your hurricane machine, is a little bit more to the north, but just enough so that it's making those tropical waves come out too far north, and they're not encountering favorable conditions. And we can see that the extremely warm upper-level temperatures makes the atmosphere very stable. It's capped. We talk about that with severe weather all the time. Certainly the tornado chasers do. They understand about that. Warm over warm does not work very well. So we have a basically a capped atmosphere, uh, the tropical waves coming off too far north, and we're just not in a favorable phase of the Madden-Julian oscillation. We have naturally sinking air right now that's also pushing down, almost literally, on the convection. That's why on that satellite animation I so showed you from the tidbit site, it shows very little deep convection out there, you know? It just makes sense, all right? But why did all that happen? That is very difficult to figure out. And that'll take months, if not years, to go back and say, okay, we know what is happening, but why did those things happen? And there are a variety of theories that 
again, to entertain all of them, we'd be here for hours. All right. Everything from solar activity, possible, I don't know, to the volcano over in the Southwest Pacific, Tonga, whatever it was in 2022, with 40 billion gallons of extra water vapor in the upper atmosphere. You know, there's a lot of theories and it'll get flushed out over the coming years. But these four bullet points here or numbered points, whatever, that's what we're looking at. This is the what, why it happened. Eh, that'll have to, that has to be figured out later. So let's just kind of scroll on through. And again, accountability all the way through these last few months, high numbers of activity, absolutely solid based on what we thought we knew. Warm Atlantic, very, uh, the onset of the La Nina, et cetera. And yeah, we thought it was well on its way. So here, and I will put a link to this just in case you're looking for it. You want to do some deep reading. Um, they talk about the recap. I did that already. All these different agencies, very, very unanimous for the most part that we were going to have a very busy season. And here it is right here. Two of the primary reasons for the hyperactive Atlantic hurricane season forecast were the continued extremely warm Atlantic as well as a likely transition to La Nina. But those two puzzle pieces alone clearly are not enough because look where we are. So here are a bunch of really cool graphics and charts. You got Africa in there. Again, this is the tropical wave machine. And Africa has been really, really wet, especially north of the Sahel region. And uh, wind shear has been funky in the Atlantic. Yet we still had barrel. Let's don't forget the earliest Cat 5 in recorded history. And just a real quick delve back to that. Like people were arguing over that. Well, we don't know what there was happening 500 years ago or a million years ago. Ah, just give me a break. It's a tiny percentage of people that act that way, but it's annoying, right? Of course we didn't know. That's why it says in recorded history. <laughs> Maybe people need to go back to school. I don't know. Anyway, it's just, what the heck? So anyway, we did have barrel and it was catastrophic, especially for the Southeast Caribbean and, you know, for people that had to suffer through it and the people that lost their lives in Houston because the power was out, I would say that was pretty catastrophic too. So here are the different things that he mentioned in the first paragraph explained further. And there's some pretty cool graphics. I do want to show you this as I scroll down. Yeah, this is some of that air, that more stable air that is getting sort of injected down into the deep tropics here. Pretty cool set of graphics that he has included. Clearly, Dr. Klotzbach and the people that he's working with put a lot of effort into this. It's not just some willy-nilly one-pager to placate people. This is how science works. This is important, though. This is really big. The mean western portion of the intertropical, um, what is that, the front? The intertropical front, kind of like your ITCZ over Africa. The black line is normally where it's supposed to be, and the red line are your observed average positions. It was a little bit south in June to July. Maybe that helped to contribute to what gave us barrel. Who knows, right? Then it was just slightly north of the mean position until recently, and as we got into August, and into August, bam! And you see, well, the market doesn't look like that's that far north of the line there. You know, it's not some deviation like that. But listen, you're talking geographics, you know, when, you, when you're looking at a spatial distribution of where this normally is, that much difference clearly makes a difference because the tropical waves aren't coming off at a latitude that allows them to develop. And we can see all of this, but the question behind all of this is why? And we don't know for sure. Again, that takes a lot more research and observations and piling everything up and people will work on that later. This next part, the cap, the upper tropospheric warming. Again, when you have warm air over warm air, you don't get a lot of lift in the atmosphere that gets shut off. We call that a cap, uh, generally speaking, and it's made the atmosphere pretty stable out there. But the Atlantic stays nice and warm, certainly. Uh, overall, no question about that. Uh, let's keep moving through. Oh, yeah, here's your anomalies of these very warm 200 millibar temperatures. Again, that's your warm air over warm air and warm unstable air but if it doesn't rise into anything you don't have an imbalance everything's too warm but you know what's funny about that 
And Matt and I, one of my good friends, not Matt down at Wink TV, but another Matt. We got a lot of Matts on our, our, our inner circle here. Um, we're talking like the warm temperatures up at 200 millibars are like minus 54 Celsius, something like that. So let's just call it the low minus 50s Celsius. And the warm temperatures at the surface are what, 80, 81 degrees at the top of the ocean there, you know, right above the ocean. Uh, 83 degrees in the ocean itself, whatever. Um, and the lower part of the atmosphere, 80, 75, whatever you in the atmosphere cools as you go up. But apparently, the imbalance is enough that when it's not cold, like minus 54, but it's really minus 53, that's just enough to throw things off. Isn't that remarkable? I think it is. That hurricane development is so fragile that even the slightest temperature change that we wouldn't even notice. Uh, and let's just put it in regular terms. Let's say it was, and we'll use Fahrenheit so we can all keep up with it better. Let's say it's 74 degrees in your room, wherever you are, and somebody made it 74.8. Would you notice the difference? Probably not. But in the atmosphere, that makes a huge difference in terms of instability. Where when the upper atmosphere is just a little bit warmer, it throws the whole thing off. That's freaking remarkable. It really is. How many of you knew that? I kind of knew it, but this really brings it to the forefront, doesn't it? I think so. So the temperature anomalies in the upper atmosphere, just foobard. I mean, that's just the way it is. But why? Again, don't know. And it's important in science to say we don't know. And then we could put a little parentheses yet because we will try to figure it out. Too much easterly shear in the eastern Atlantic. So easterly means like if this is east over here on a map, the wind is coming from the east. That African easterly jet was just too strong. Too much monsoon, right? Too much of a good thing for hurricanes to develop. I'm talking just pure development. All right? I don't want people getting mad. Oh, he thinks hurricanes are good. Well, they do serve a purpose. They just, we get in the way of them. That's the problem. What else did I want to show you? Um... Some of the upper level wind shear, this is interesting too. Some of these graphs, clearly you can see these very strong vectors coming off of Africa. There's Africa right there. Too strong, too much, too much monsoon trough, too much everything. It was just too much. And then, of course, the Madden-Julian oscillation, just not favorable overall. Now it's positioned over in the maritime continent region. Call that in and around Indonesia, Philippines, whatnot. And what do you got? We got us. Pretty solid typhoon over there. Yagi, I think it's its name. So what happens, and we'll get to this when this moves back around and favors the Atlantic Basin. Hmm, we'll get to that. Because remember, it is only September 4th that I'm recording this. So this is interesting, too. The EPS 850 to 200 millibar bulk shear, basically you know, your shear map, not favorable in this chart. This is days one through five, um, basically from the 3rd of September yesterday through the 8th. Doesn't look very favorable. You move forward a little bit. And uh, now out to the 13th of September, the 8th through the 13th of the next five days. That's a little bit more favorable out here. And yeah, not so good over here. Uh, how about going towards the last part of the month or so, mid to last part? This takes us out to, um, let me make sure I got this right, 8th through the 13th. This is the, yeah, 13th through the 18th. The next five days, whoa! Now you're talking. Now you got these fairly impressive uh, easterly anomalies, but they're not crazy. You don't see the, e the easterly jet just screaming out here. Now, will the EPS be wrong? That's the ensemble prediction system. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. It's just what it's showing. So anyway, uh, what does the rest of the Atlantic hurricane season have in store? That is the potential multi-billions of dollars question and lives at stake. And for those of you that are going to even begin with the whole, oh, there he goes, fear-mongering again, just check out now. Just check out. Go away. Don't need you. Seriously. We're trying to figure out an atmosphere that is so complex, it's mind-blowing. All right? And when we look at what we're looking at, and we're trying to piece these things together, at least I know what I'm doing here at our channel and our group of people is to have as much warning as possible so that we can be ready. If that scares people, you truly do need to check out. Seriously, you got to just read the National Hurricane Center stuff, Weather Service stuff. It's very straightforward and very much in a box, if you will. That's neither good nor bad. It just is what it is. 
if you want more in-depth looks at stuff, then keep paying attention. But zip it with the fear-mongering. Don't need it. It's not true. And that's the last I'm going to say of it. All right? You're probably going, oh, we'll see about that, Mark. Rant over. So what does the rest of the season have in store? So far, it's been a tale of two hurricane seasons, with the first part of the season being extremely busy, followed by an extremely quiet period. I'm adding some stuff here, obviously. Uh, are there any signs that the Atlantic hurricane, he yeah, left out a word, poor Phil, probably typing it up, that the Atlantic hurricane season will get busy again? As noted in our recently released two-week forecast, uh, we are anticipating below normal activity over the next two weeks due to all that stuff we just showed you and whatever, especially the unfavorable MJO. However, the Atlantic hurricane season does not end in mid-September. Of course it doesn't, right? Just like in 2017, when Falcons were up over the Patriots 28-3, to I think it was the start of the fourth quarter, the game was not over. And yet an idiot like me sent a text to my good friend Carrie and said there's no way they're coming back. Whew. Glad I didn't have any money on that. <laughs> I guess we all know what happened. I know hurricanes and sports are only, you know, weather and sports are only on the news. Ha ha. But it does not end in mid-September. Seriously. We still have an extremely warm Atlantic and a tropical Pacific that will likely be trending more towards La Nina as the season progresses. Figure 22 displays current sea surface temperature anomalies, etc. Past two weeks, a pronounced trade wind surge across the tropical Pacific has caused significant cooling in the central tropical Pacific and will likely lead to a strong upwelling, ocean, upwelling oceanic Kelvin wave over the next few weeks, i.e. La Nina coming. The most recent forecast from NOAA also anticipates a trend towards La Nina over the next few months. And um, typically, La Nina and a warm Caribbean enhance late season storm activity due to a strengthening of the Caribbean Central American gyre. Colorado State University issues an operational October to November Caribbean forecast. And here it is which will likely call for an active late season in the Caribbean given its two input parameters are ENSO, basically we're headed towards La Nina, and Caribbean Sea surface temperatures, which, if I just need to remind you, I will. There is our developing La Nina, and here is our very warm Caribbean. As I said the other day, we take the loss out here, blew it, didn't see it coming. We lose all those storms, all those ace points. Most of these are out in the open Atlantic anyway, most of them. Some of them aren't, but we don't even have to worry about those except for barrel. Barrel has already happened. Everything that happens from here forward, I said this the other day, is really most concerning in this area right through here for most people, and that's just the facts. Some sneak through and they go up the East Coast. Yes, we know that. But more likely than not, the strengthening La Nina, and let's go back to this map here because it's just bigger scale. This right here combined with this right here Everybody that has any sense at all of this stuff, you know what could be coming, will keep tuning in, not to boost my likes, views, and all that bull hockey, but to stay informed and ahead of the curve. That's the end game here. We want to make sure people are well prepared, not scared. I'm, hopefully I'm not scary, because it is still only the 4th of September. And we look and see what's happened in the past, and we have no idea what's going to happen in the future in terms of concrete evidence. All right? So there you go. That's all of that. Got a couple more things to show you, which are a lot more positive. Eh, kind of related to this, too, and then I'll let you go. First, uh, the GFS. Yeah, good old GFS. The models have just been like, what? Those have been crazy as well. Uh, 12Z run from today, 850 millibars. Let's just take it out two weeks. Why not, right? 16 days. Look, a few little systems out there all swirling around each other. Nothing major. Looks like we could get some East Pack development right down there. This is about a week out or so. There it is anyway. So we got to watch for that. Never know. Maybe something that goes up towards the desert southwest. Uh, meantime, yes, there are tropical waves coming off, and this is important. There it is. They're coming off at lower latitudes. Okay? Already starting to see it show up in the operationals that were showing either nothing or these waves were coming off up here. Like, seriously, they were. Now we're starting to see that energy focus more to the south. And we still have all that warm water out there. So we'll see. Take this all the way out to the end of the period. Yeah, you know, we still have to pay attention. This is only September 20th. 
so much can happen between that date and November 30th, it might probably make your head spin. And you just got to look back at seasons like 2020. We saw what that October and November did, right? And on that note, very serious here. I'm not just trying to plug our awesome partner, but keep in mind, flood insurance takes 30 days to, you, you, oh, there's a hurricane coming. Let's call the National Flood Insurance Program. Doesn't work that way. So a good reminder from our terrific friends up in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, the Quick Dam folks, that flood insurance takes 30 days to take effect. So purchase it now. Something is better than nothing, especially since you consider that the flood insurance cost is literally a drop in the bucket, pun intended, uh, versus the cost of actual flood damage. And for those of you that have been through it, I can't even imagine. All right, so be sure to check that coverage. Now, this is awesome. I'm very excited about this. Over the last few months, I've been working with Fox Weather to produce a documentary um, kind of about our camera systems and the whole project here at Hurricane Track. And this will be airing on Saturday night, 8 p.m. On Friday and Saturday, I'll do a few hits on Fox Weather as we tease it and talk about it. Very, very cool. I haven't seen it yet. It'll be a surprise to me once we do see it together this coming Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eyes in the Storm on Fox Weather, a nice little chronological history in about 24 minutes. Cool interviews, maybe even some people that I didn't know they got interviewed. That could be really cool. It'll be a good surprise for me. Um, yeah, this coming Saturday, a retrospective of how, how far we've come over the last 20 years especially. All right, look forward to that on Fox Weather this coming Saturday evening. Okay, so we covered a lot. Uh, I did some yelling and just a little bit of cursing. <laughs> just quoting somebody anyway. Uh, you don't get that all the time. But look, this is a very serious thing. It really is. Uh, hurricanes do serve a tremendous purpose in the global heat budget of our planet. And as the late great, he's not late yet. Wow, almost messed that up. He better not be late. You know what that means. Dr. Neil Frank, my apologies. He's still great, though. Uh, he did say that uh, if we didn't have hurricanes, we'd probably have something worse. So we have to be thankful that at least we do have a phenomenon on this planet that can dissipate some of that heat. And the problem is we're in the way. That's what the you know, natural disaster, my butt, it's a man-made disaster because we're the ones that are in the way of these things. And we just got to be smart about it, not be so dismissive and not be so willing to attack people that are trying to help you at the end of the day. You know, that's as, that's as succinctly as I can put it, all right? So thanks for hanging out with me this afternoon. I hope you learned something. I did, just presenting this stuff to you. From all of us at Hurricane Track, I'm Mark Suddeth. I'll see you again tomorrow.